The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Welcome to Health for a Lifetime. Today we are happy to have Dr. Clarence Ng with us from Weimar Institute. And Dr. Ng is an ophthalmologist as well as someone who specializes in preventive medicine. Welcome. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Don. Tell me a little bit about uh, preventive medicine. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it's interesting. Most people, when they think of preventive medicine and they think of coming to see someone who takes care of preventive medicine, they say, I really don't want to come see you because if I come see you, you know what's going to happen? I'm not going to have any more fun. <laughs> they say preventive medicine is taking all the fun out of life, but I've realized really truly the goal of preventive medicine is to give you more life to enjoy the fun. So you're not trying to prevent things that are, that are good for us. You are just trying to help us prevent things that are harmful for us. Absolutely. Well, what would make you different than someone else? I mean, are there other people that specialize in preventive medicine? What's your special niche? Why would the viewers today uh, be interested in what you have to say about it? Well, some of the areas of preventive medicine, you, you remember when you take your children to the Well Baby Clinic and they get immunizations and shots. If you go travel, you get shots and things like this. And that's an important part of preventive medicine. But the part of preventive medicine that I really enjoy is what you might also call lifestyle medicine. Because as we look at the diseases that Americans have, I find that most of the diseases are related to their lifestyles. If we can help people recognize what their lifestyles are and what they, how they influence their life, we can have a profound effect. Because one of the things that I like to tell people is, you know, today is the first day of the rest of your life. I don't know what you did in the past. What you did in the past, I can't change, you can't change. But what's really important is what we can do from today and tomorrow and each day onward. Because no matter what you've done before, you can do things differently now. If you know that it's important for you to do these things differently. Now you've worked around the world. You've seen different things. I was talking with you at the break. What are some things in America that, that really are lifestyle things that we have to be concerned about? Well, as I look at Americans and I look at the Western lifestyle, it's obvious that Americans don't suffer diseases of deficiencies like we find in the developing world. You know, you don't have people with vitamin deficiency, protein deficiencies, calorie deficiencies. What we see in America are diseases of excess, excess calories, too much fat, too much sugar, too much refined food, and maybe, well, maybe one deficit or deficiency they might have is not enough exercise. In other words, we have lots of leisure time, but most of our leisure time is rather sedentary, maybe spent in front of the TV exercising our finger as we change the remote <laughs> control. <laughs> and that really doesn't do too much for exercise. Well, part of what you've said there does sound like you want to prevent some things that we're eating and, and change that. Uh, but what, what about that person that says, hey, that's just what I like to eat. That's what I'm used to eating. That tastes good to me. Well, I say... I agree it tastes good, but why don't you try and expand your appetite, expand your horizons, and look at some other areas and some other foods that maybe you haven't tried. Because basically, many of the foods that we start with may be good when we start with them, but by the time we get them to our plate, somehow along the way we may have added or changed things. They may not be quite as healthy as when we first started. You know, another saying that we have is health, is a function or a result of lifestyle. Lifestyle can be chosen. The choice is yours. You know, the other interesting thing is that people don't realize that their lifestyle includes everything that they do as well as things that they don't do. Most, 
usually we think of lifestyle, well, that's just what I do, but what I don't do doesn't make any difference. But when you talk to them and help them explain some of this, like did you know that if you exercise, that's important compared to not exercising. Whether I use coffee or tea or whether I smoke or use alcohol, does that make a difference in my health, in my lifestyle? And as we explore the statistics and we look at the facts, we find that absolutely it's really true. It does make a difference because as we look at the human body, just from the standpoint of exercise, we find that people were designed, we were created to be active. And when we're not active, when we don't exercise regularly, our lifespan is shortened. Or another way of saying it is, if you live the normal active lifestyle, you will live out your normal lifespan. If you choose to live the sedentary lifestyle, your, life's, your life will be shortened. In fact, one physician said, if you're planning on living a sedentary lifestyle, you should have a very thorough physical examination to find <laughs> out if you're in good enough health to endure that lifestyle. <laughs> All right. So what you're saying is that sometimes we just can't, we can't trust our feelings, our appetites, our impulses. We've got to be actively involved in, in decisions. This is true. Decisions are really important. In fact, as we look at, you know, being at Weimar, one of the principles that almost all of our listeners have heard about is something called New Start. Well, New Start is an acronym, and each letter means something. N is nutrition, E is exercise, W is water, S is sunshine, T is temperance. Temperance means using nothing which is harmful and using in moderation those things which are good. A is air, R is rest, and T is trust in God, trust in divine power. And all of these make up part of a healthful lifestyle if we learn how to incorporate these into what we say and what we do. It makes a vast difference. We don't have to go somewhere to learn that, do we? Or do, does, do people have to go away to some place like Weimar or some other place? Uh, what kind of things can they do right now during this program? What are some good decisions, some good principles they could put in place even during today's program? Well, a good principle that I think that all of us need to start with is I think it's, we know it's really important for people to eat breakfast. You know, we say eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince and suffer like a pauper. But somehow in the United States, and I think really most parts of the world, I think we kind of turn it around. We have, if we have breakfast at all, it's usually maybe skimpy, a cup of coffee or tea and a roll, if we get that much, and dash off to work because it just takes too much effort to fix a good breakfast. And we like to come home in the evening and we relax, and that's the time when we can have with our family. And when we do that, we tend to have a nice meal, we're relaxed. And if we have that nice evening meal, well, most Americans don't go out and they don't go out and have some exercise after they have their evening meal. So whatever extra calories that they've taken in, they have to be stored some ways. Part of them are stored, you know, in the liver and the muscles as glycogen. But the ones that aren't going to be stored as that get to be stored as something we don't like to talk about. It's called fat. <laughs> So what do you have for breakfast? What do you do in your family? Well, in my family, I often have granola for breakfast with some fruit. And the other thing that I really like for breakfast as well as that is I like to eat for breakfast what many people would eat in the evening for their evening meal. In other words, instead of having your big dinner in the evening, I like to have food like that for breakfast. Now, of course, that may take a little cooperation from your wife or mm -hmm. whoever fixes your food. But the thing is also, you can have food like that, and I'm not adverse to eating food that has been uh, appeared before, like they say, pre-owned cards, pre-owned cars. <laughs> I don't know what, how you would say this for food, but in other words, you would bring food out, and if you haven't finished it all, you can still use it. Some it's leftovers. Some leftovers, yeah. And uh, Does it take more time then? You have to budget more time for your breakfast? Not really, especially if you're used to using granola, because... If you're in a rush, there's no way you're going to get the granola to go, to go down much faster. It takes a certain amount of time to chew it. And if you're really in a rush and you don't have the time, granola is really not for you. You'll probably do better with some bread and toast. But 
There again, we're starting to get into some of the rules which really aren't so good because then you're trying to hurry your meal and eat too fast. What kind of health benefits does breakfast have for you? You know, you've probably said this before to people. What, the people that implement this, what are going to be the benefits they see in a week, in a month? Well, they find that if you get a good breakfast, you'll be able to do your morning work better. I mean, I use an example in, of a student who went to school, a little six-year-old. He goes to school, and he's the problem child in class. He doesn't pay attention. His teacher tries to work with him, tries to help him to, to learn, and he just disturbs all the other students. So finally, she talks to him, and she says, um, Sam said, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Sam said, well, teacher, I didn't have anything for breakfast. She says, why not? He says, well, teacher, I just got up in time to catch the bus to get to school. If I had breakfast, I would have missed the bus. And the teacher says, well, how come you got up so late? He says, well, Sam, that was because I was watching television last <laughs> night. Television, till what time? Sam now is six years old. He's in the first grade. Well, I was watching um, Jay Leno or oh, well, whatever, but other, he was up watching television late. He wasn't getting his sleep. So the teacher says, I've got a great idea. Tomorrow morning, Sam, I have a surprise for you. Sam came in the next morning. She had a good breakfast for him. She gave him a good breakfast. He had the breakfast. She said, Sam, I'd like you to lie down here and take a little nap for a while. He took a nap. His behavior was completely different for the rest of the day. She says, Sam, I need to go home and talk to your dad and mom, see if we can make some changes. A good breakfast is important. You start a trip, you want to fill the car with gas before you go. The same principle applies to our nutrition and energy for the day. So your mind is going to be clear. You're going to get a full tank of gas when you start out. Yeah, you'll do better. What are some other things uh, that we can do? Well, another important thing that I've found in people here in the United States as well in a as in Asia is people like to eat, and they don't like to stop eating. So sometimes, you know, we tend to snack or eat in between meals. Or another term I have found that applies to people, some people say, well, doc, I only eat once a day. I just start in the morning and I eat all day long. <laughs> the term they use here in the U.S. is they call that grazing. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that really is not too good for your digestive system. Your digestive system doesn't function well under those circumstances. And it also brings in extra calories, which we don't need as well. So you shouldn't, uh, you're saying you shouldn't eat between your meals? Absolutely. The best thing between meals is water. And that's a great time to take your water. Nothing, you know, you know don't take your water with your meals. Nothing between meals but water. And that's really the best way. I know that uh, you're going to spend some more time with us on some other programs coming up, but... What about, what about a diabetic? What about if he goes to his dietician and the dietician says, look, you need to have eight meals a day? Uh, that's interesting because we've had some interesting experiences with diabetics. But again, diabetics do best on a three-meal-a-day plan with nothing between meals. When they get the right types of food, we call them whole plant foods, eaten whole, they do much, much better. It's been amazing how much their blood sugars will come down, how much we can decrease their medicine. And I have some very interesting experiences and case histories to share with you later on about this. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. I know we want to spend maybe a whole uh, hour together on that, half hour together on that. Also, we've talked about uh, things that we can simply do being, uh, you know, have a big breakfast. We've also talked about not eating between meals. When we come back from our break, uh, I think there's some other principles you have to share with us. We are talking with Dr. Clarence Ng from Weimar Institute, where he is an ophthalmologist and also a specialist in preventive medicine. We hope that you join us when we come back. Have you found yourself wishing that you could shed a few pounds? Have you been on a diet for most of your life, but not found anything that will really keep the weight off? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, then we have a solution for you that works. Dr. Hans Deal and Dr. Eileen Luddington have written a marvelous booklet called Reversing Obesity Naturally, and we'd like to send it to you free of charge. Here's a medically sound approach successfully used by thousands who were able to eat more and lose weight permanently without feeling guilty or hungry through lifestyle medicine. Dr. Deal and Dr. Luddington have been featured on 3ABM, 
And in this booklet, they present a sensible approach to eating, nutrition, and lifestyle changes that can help you prevent heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. Call or write today for your free copy of Reversing Obesity Naturally, and you could be on your way to a healthier, happier you. It's absolutely free of charge, so call or write today. Welcome back. We've been talking with Dr. Clarence Ng from Weimar Institute. And we've had an interesting discussion on what we can do to prevent disease and uh, really have a great lifestyle. We've talked about several things, about having a big breakfast. We've talked about not eating in between meals. What other things can we do, doctor? Well, another thing that's really important is leaning towards a plant-based diet. People say, well, what's that? Well, I said, that's a new way of saying vegetarian. <laughs> have you ever thought about that? It's a politically correct way. Politically right? correct. Okay. But it's really exciting how much changes you, know, you can make as far as your, your health goes. But it's interesting, even though that's a new way of saying it, back in 1961, there was an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association that said we could eliminate 97% of our heart attacks if everyone ate a vegetarian diet. Now, if we look at the United States and we say that almost a million people die every year from heart, heart disease, and if that statement were true, and I have no reason to disbelieve it, because when you look at people who follow and live uh, and eat a totally plant-based diet, their risk of heart disease is way, way down compared to those who eat our typical American diet. It makes a big difference. So the medical community is now recognizing that's a pretty prestigious journal, isn't it? Journal American Medical Association. They don't just say things uh, uh, off cuff. Um, it's a peer-reviewed journal and, right. and all of that. So what they're saying is if we move towards a plant-based or vegetarian diet, we can eliminate the number one killer in America. Yes, and they said that 37 years, well, 38 years ago, because that was 1961 when that editorial was written. But as we look at the statistics and data now, we find that you know, from the Adventist Health Study and other studies that show when people do follow a plant-based diet, their cholesterol has come down quite dramatically. And we find people who come to Weimar and other places where I've worked with high cholesterols, and they say, but doc, which pill shall I take? I said, well, have you thought about changing your diet? I said, well, no, I haven't thought about that. I said, well, if you've got too much cholesterol in your blood, why don't you try to take it out of the food that you eat? Oh, well, I never thought about that. But really, Doc, it'd be much easier to take a pill. I said, well, but really, it'd be much better to change your diet. So we worked with them that way. And of course, there's a very interesting text found in Leviticus that it says it shall be a perpetual statute that you eat neither the fat nor the blood. That's found in Leviticus 3.17. And if I'm really going to follow the biblical concept, well, don't eat fat, don't eat blood, there's no way that I can really eat meat or fish or chicken without eating fat or blood. Well, you say, why are you saying meat, fish, and chicken? Because, well, I say it that way because sometimes if I say meat, people don't consider fish and chicken meat. Mm -hmm. I do, but they don't. So that's why I have to be very specific when I talk with people about their changes. Can that be done? I mean, is there good food aside from meat, fish, and chicken? Oh, there's lots of wonderful food aside from meat, fish, and chicken. And I've been able to experience that for quite a few years. In fact, many years ago, before our first son was ever born, as my wife and I were talking about the future and what we were going to do, I told her, I said, dear, you know, there's something that's really important. I would really like to have all of our children raised on, at that time we said, vegetarian diet. Now I would say, plant-based diet. <laughs> and she said, that sounds like a good idea to me. And so we did that. Of course, along the way, we had a few relatives and others object to this and saying, you know, that really isn't good. Your children are smaller than others. They're not going to, they're scrawny and skinny because, and short because you're not giving them enough meat. I said, just wait, just wait. And now they look at us and they say, how come your children are so big? I said, and what did you do? I said, well, it was a long time ago. We decided to raise them on a plant-based diet because my oldest son is six foot three, which is a bit taller than I am. <laughs> and my other children are all likewise just about as tall as I am or, or taller, except for my daughter. Of course, she's shorter, but for a Chinese 
you know, ethnic origin for a young lady, she's tall. She's five foot seven. It hasn't uh, retarded their mental abilities at all? No, not at all. In fact, they did better than I did in school, I'm ashamed to say. I'm happy <laughs> to say, I should say. I'm happy to say that. Okay, so we're moving then away from the, uh, the meat products, and uh, what else are we avoiding? What else are we doing? Well, something else that's interesting is we think that whole plant foods and whole plant foods really don't include you know, sugar in the sense that we go down and find it in soft drinks and things of this nature. It's an amazing fact that Americans c consume as much sugar in sweeteners as they do. I was just reading in a magazine the other, a few weeks ago, that Americans now consume almost 150 pounds of sweeteners every year, 20% more sugar in sweeteners than they did in 1986. And 152 pounds? 152 pounds. How much know. do you weigh? I mean, Less maybe, than that. Maybe I, I, <laughs> I would know. I weigh about 140 to 145 pounds. Look at that. Most people eat uh, the entire size of the doctor here. That's right. But, you know, the other thing is soft drinks. They said that the average American consumes 19 ounces of soft drinks every day or 53 gallons a mm. year. But the 15. average teenage boy consumes approximately 43 ounces. The average teenage girl, 25% less, which would make that somewhere around 32 ounces a day. That's more than a quart of, uh, you know, Cokes or whatever, soft drinks every day. So what are the real damaging things about that? Doesn't the body just run on sugar? Well, yes, but it does better on the non-refined sugars that we're going to get with our potatoes and breads and rice rather than your refined sugars. So. The other problem we also have with these extra sugars is we get more dental caries or cavities that may keep, make the dentist happy and keep them busy, but we <laughs> can save a lot of uh, expense and discomfort by eating a more healthful diet and avoiding this. And the other thing we also find is that with the high consumption of sugar, we find a lot more illnesses and sicknesses. Have you ever noticed around holidays or where people tend to have more sweets like the birthday or when you know, the people, they go out on Christmas and other times, and the children get more sweets. I found that when children come to my office brought by their parents, oftentimes you'll ask them, have you had celebrated a birthday or had more sweets? And they say, oh, yes. Doc says, now I know why at Christmas time in, in Asia, where I worked for so long, the Lunar New Year, so many people get sick. The very reason. In university students who may be studying and cramming for an exam, they're hungry in the late at night, what do they do? They go down to um, the convenience store and they buy a bottle of soda pop and some donuts and come back home and they eat that, no sleep, and they come down a few days later with a cold or flu. So what should we put in place of uh, some of these harmful junk foods, you'd call them? Well, I still like my favorite cereal grain is rice. I know. Most Americans' favorite cereal grain is wheat, but you know, there's good whole wheat bread. You know, you've got potatoes, and baked potatoes are good, mashed potatoes are good, and you know, they're much more healthful for you than French fries and potato chips. And you know, it's a good source of complex carbohydrate. It's a whole plant food as you take it that way. So, what we're talking about then is uh, really uh, another principle it's choosing. What would you say? Foods is grown. How would you how would you put it? Whole plant foods eaten whole. Whole plant foods eaten, eaten whole. whole. Five words for a great nutrition course. You know, and then another principle is for your fatty type foods, use nuts and seeds and olives. These are great sources of natural fats. Along with avocados. Avocados are really good. Avocados make a great spread rather than mayonnaise. And nuts and seeds are a good source of protein as well. Some people like, for instance, Dr. Dean Ornish and others that are, uh, you know, advocating a 10% fat diet or around there would say stay away from nuts. I don't hear you saying that. Well, you know, I'm talking about people in good health. I think that's fine. They can go ahead and eat and enjoy the nuts. In fact, the group at Loma Linda and the Adventist, uh, they had been working with the Adventist Health Study but Dr. Gary Fraser and some others have done some studies with nuts, and mm -hmm. I think using walnuts specifically, and have found out that this helps to lower cholesterol for certain groups of people. So 
Nuts, again, used in moderation, and the key is moderation, is a very good principle. If you take the nuts and have to crack them yourself, you're not going to eat so many. If you buy them already shelled and cracked, you're going to eat a lot more. Well, that's a good, that's a good uh, way to, to avoid eating too many. So we've talked about, about five principles now. Um, and uh, are there any, uh, any other principles you want to share in our last two minutes? Right. Another good principle is to drink enough water. I find that oftentimes people don't drink enough water. And because of this, they, their body doesn't operate at optimal efficiency. And well, you say, how much water should you drink? Well, a rule that we use is we say one eight-ounce glass of water for approximately each 15 pounds of body weight. So if you weigh 150 pounds, that would be you would have to have 10 glasses of water or two and a half quarts of water. So another way you can also tell is you can look at the color of the urine. If it's clear, it's not dark yellow, you know, then you've had enough water. If the urine is dark yellow, providing you haven't eaten a cereal or something with food coloring in it, then this gives you an indication that you've had enough water. So that's, that's important. It also lowers the risk for kidney disease and kidney stones. The only people who I find who really take in enough water, usually those who have had kidney stones, and you'll see they'll walk around with their big quart jar of, of water, which they take with them wherever they go. And nowadays, it's very popular to see people with their jars of mm -hmm. water as they walk around. That's much better, isn't it? Much, much better. Well, we've talked about several very important principles. Maybe you can, in this last 50 seconds we have together, summarize for the people that have been watching, uh, what are these seven healthy habits that we really should get into as we begin a, a new phase in our lifestyle? Well, the important thing is eat breakfast. Another one is don't eat in between meals. Another one is eat more of your, what we call your complex carbohydrates, whole plant foods, more fruits and vegetables, plant protein rather than animal protein. That's important. And also for your fats, get your fat sources, again, preferably from vegetable sources of, of um, fats, like your nuts and your seeds, olives, avocados, things like this. Drink enough water and also get in some exercise. Exercise is vitally important. I'm sure you'll have a whole program in the future on exercise, which I know is really important. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you have health for a lifetime.